Now, as always during the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, please use the chat box to uh, type those questions in, and we promise we'll save some time at the end of the presentation to try to answer all of those questions. Dr. Zilber is an author and serves on the board of the uh, Phoenix Holocaust Association. Good evening, doctor, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And thank you to all who, uh, who logged in to hear the story. And a special shout out to the CAF in Mesa, um, where my husband is a volunteer. So I would like to tell you a story. And um, it's a historical, it's documented, and it's the testimony of my family. And I've entitled it, As Mama Told Us. But in fact, it's not just Mama's story. It's also my father's story, Papa's story, and my grandparents' story. Uh, because they all came from the same town. And I'll tell you more about that. So this is Mama. And um, Mama uh, used to go into schools and tell her story. There is nothing that is more impactful and life altering actually than a student listening to somebody telling their history, from, uh, telling about history from their personal perspective. And uh, students are truly, truly impacted by these uh, stories and testimonies by survivors. Um, but unfortunately, Mama's no longer with us. So you got me. And uh, so I've made a commitment to continue telling Mama's story. And uh, for me, it was most important to learn the story. And that's why we recorded her testimony. And um, I wanted the story from start to finish for myself, for my sisters, and also for my children. And now for my grandchildren as well. Uh, I, I believe it's really important for kids to know where they came from, what is their own personal history, uh, even if it is a difficult history. Um, my other commitment is uh, educating the public, educating audiences so that the Holocaust isn't forgotten. I speak to students, thousands of students in the United States as well as overseas. Uh, before COVID, I would actually be invited to come to other countries. Last year, I was invited to speak at uh, six schools in Germany and in Peru and, and in other countries. Uh, now I do it on Zoom. Uh, for me, it's really important because, uh, as we know, anti-Semitism, racism, and othering it really never ended. Um, it's also important for me uh, because um, there are many people who deny the Holocaust. And with the internet, that message gets out to the younger generation. And um, it's important for them to hear uh, from survivors firsthand testimonies. And if not firsthand, then their children. And there are also those who distort the Holocaust. Um, and that's something I'll, I'll speak about a little later. It's important for me also to, as they say in Spanish, uh, add my grano de arena, a little grain of sand, to the documentation of the Holocaust. Uh, because every survivor is adding information to the documentation. And in my research about my mother's story, I documented everything she said with uh, additional primary and secondary sources. And in my travels around the world, I've worked, I've worked in international schools in six countries, and I've worked with kids from hundreds of countries. And um, there is no blame for descendants. The children are not to be blamed for the behavior and the actions of their parents. And I let them know that. And uh, so that's, that's important for me to, I believe it, and I, it's important to tell them about it. So I've put mom's, uh, I've published mom's story in a book, and uh, I wanna thank the CAF for purchasing some books, which they will um, raffle off to some of you in the audience. 
Um, it is Mama's memoir, and it's also um, a second memoir. It's my memoir as a child of survivors. As we know now, um, trauma is actually can be transmitted intergenerationally. So there's a lot more research being done today on that. And uh, if that's of interest to you, we can talk about it later. So um, I don't know how many of you saw the latest uh, edition of Dispatch. And when I received it at home, my husband brought it home. Uh, he showed me that the entire edition was dedicated to um, the Holocaust, the survivors, the liberators, the history of that period of time. I was so taken by it that I wrote to, um, to the editors, and uh, that's when I started my conversation with Leah Block. And, uh, and thank you, Leah, and the team for inviting me to speak today. Um, and thank you for continuing to tell the story. Uh, this is a very timely uh, moment right now because next week on the 27th, um, we will be commemorating International Holocaust Remembrance Day. This is an international uh, day and um, you will be hearing a lot about the Holocaust on radio, on TV, in schools, uh, around the world, excuse me, and uh, so this is very timely. Uh, I, I, I find it important to uh, give a definition of the Holocaust with a capital H, uh, because Holocaust with a small h is a common noun. But the definition that uh, is used by the, um, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington is the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of approximately six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. And that you will see as soon as I start telling the story um, uh, in, uh, of uh, the Jews in Eastern Europe. Um, the um, the, the, during this period of time, uh, the Jews were the major target, the largest target, but they also targeted the Roma, often known as the gypsies, disabled people were killed, and many Slavic people were also targeted, and others with ideological differences, such as communists, socialists, Jehovah's Witnesses were also targeted, and homosexuals. And so there is so much uh, research and documentation about all these groups. But I will tell you about the Jewish experience. So just to put us in the framework, this is Europe in 1939. And we, I'm taking you on a trip to Lithuania. Lithuania is one of the three Baltic countries up here, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. And uh, that's where my family is from from Lithuania. And this is a, uh, a map of Lithuania. The capital today is Vilnius, uh, which before the war was actually part of Poland. Uh, my family came from Kaunas, which was at that time the, um, the capital, because Vilnius was only uh, added, um, reunited later on. So that's, that's where the action, most of the action will be taking place until they were moved elsewhere. So let me introduce you to my family. This is my grandmother, Eta, and my grandfather, Yaakov. I was named after Eta. That's my name is Eta, actually, and I was always called Eti. And uh, this is Yaakov. And my mother was thrilled when I married a guy named Jacob, Jake. Um, and if you take a look at this photo, you'll notice it's wrinkled. And there's a reason that it was wrinkled. It was hidden during the war years. My grandmother, Etta, had the foresight to give her neighbor, who she trusted, um, some family photos. She had the, the feeling that uh, they were in great danger 
and she gave the neighbor the photos, but the neighbor was afraid, of course, to be caught with the photos. So she hid them in the mattress. Um, and in those days, the mattresses were made of straw. So it got wrinkled. And um, my mother got these photos back after the war. So um, my grandfather, Jacob, Jacob, uh, he was a big uh, Lithuanian patriot, and uh, he himself uh, volunteered to, uh, to join the military during the Lithuanian Wars of Independence against Poland in 1919. And he received this medal uh, that you see here. The prime minister uh, gave all of these volunteers a medal, and that medal uh, will play a role in um, in his survival, or at least his temporary survival, uh, during the war. Uh, Jacob was a butcher, and I'll tell you a little more. This is the family, uh, four girls, my grandfather, whoops, my grandmother. This is my mother's Lata, and these are her sisters, Nahama, Ida, and Genya. And uh, this was one of the last photos before the war that was taken of the family. And you can see that this photo was also touched up because after the war, it was also wrinkled and in bad condition. My mother brought it to a professional and he, uh, he touched up the photo. And these photos were always, always hanging on the walls in every one of our homes. And... Um, and we are very fortunate because most Holocaust survivors have absolutely no photos of anybody in their family. And so having photos, photos are like holy items in our family. And, um, and we, we feel very, very fortunate that we have them so that I could actually see what my grandparents looked like because I never met them. Uh, they lived in this house, and my grandfather was a butcher, and he had his butcher shop in the front room there, and they lived upstairs and in the back. And uh, this was in a, um, a neighborhood in Kaunas. The Jews called it Kovno, Lithuania. Now, the story is also about my father's story, because my father's family were also in the same city. This is my dad. Louis, Lova, and his little sister, who is still alive, Rivka. This is my grandfather, Fievel, and my grandmother, Chaya. And Fievel was an electrician, and he eventually opened his own factory, a, a metal foundry in the city. And he opened it, he started it, and, and built it uh, just before the war. This is a, a photo I love of my father on the back of a motorcycle. My father adored, he hated school. He, he never liked school, but he adored anything that had to do with uh, mechanics, cars, motorcycles, trucks, and electronics, he learned uh, from his father. And those skills actually saved his life and saved um, the other members of his family as well. So uh, getting into history, uh, it's been 80 years exactly in Kaunas when the Soviets, the Russians, came in and occupied Lithuania. And um, as you history buffs must know, uh, the Nazis signed a non-aggression pact with uh, the Soviet Union the Ribbentrop-Molotov uh, non-aggression pact. And you, we're gonna divide Europe up. You take this part of Europe, we'll take that part of Europe, and we'll be friends. And that's what happened, for a while anyway. And these are photos taken of the uh, Soviet tanks coming into the city of Kaunas, Kovno, where my, my mother, my father lived. The, the first thing that the Soviets did was nationalize property. And in fact, um, uh, 
most businesses were nationalized. My grandfather's um, factory was nationalized. Uh, they also had an apartment in the factory, and so they were kicked out of the apartment, and the, the uh, factory was taken over, and they had to find another place to live. And many, many people were deported to Siberia. That included Jews as well as the Lithuanians themselves. And um, my great uncle was deported to Siberia. He had a uh, shoe company. And uh, my grandfather was, he found out that his name was on a list to be deported as well. However, uh, just a week after the, the beginning of the deportations, the Germans actually attacked the Soviet Union and uh, surprise attack, Operation Barbarossa. And I guess the love affair with the Soviet Union ended at that moment. And the, uh, the Nazis occupied all of the countries um, that the Soviets were in at that time. And um, this is uh, after the Nazis, the map after the Nazis attacked uh, and they went quite far into the Soviet Union. And clearly they occupied all of the countries here on, in Eastern Europe and including, excuse me, including Lithuania. So my mother starts her story. She was a teenager, she was 16. And when I tell these stories to students in schools, they, you know, they definitely identify. She was coming home from a date and all of a sudden they saw that the airport outside was being bombed. And uh, at that same moment, and this is why it's important the definition of the Holocaust is uh, what took place by the Nazis and their collaborators. These are Lithuanian militias that came out and attacked Jews immediately before the Germans even came in. And they um, murdered thousands of people, ransacked their homes, pillaged, uh, burned down uh, synagogues. There are a lot of photos. I will not show them to you. They are awful. Um, but uh, the killings are well known uh, that all of these killings took place before the, uh, the Germans actually occupied and took over the city. There are a lot of reasons for that. I won't go into it at this time. They burned buildings, they burned synagogues, ransacked people's homes, pulled them out, and murdered them on the street. Um, my mother's family decided to try and escape, but um, they didn't get very far. There were tens of thousands of people trying to leave the city, including the Russians, who, uh, Russian soldiers who were leaving the city. But they didn't get very far. They were arrested and they were turned back to the city. And they were taken to a place called the Seventh Fort. The city of Kaunas is, rung, is ringed with nine forts that were built during the Tsar's time. And uh, this was fort number seven. And uh, this fort became a killing field. As you can see, these are actual photos. All of the people were brought up to the fort. The men were separated from the women and the children. These are photos of the men, and this is in the month of uh, the end of June, beginning of July, 1941. And it was summer and it was hot and the men were kept outside, no water, no food, and uh, the objective was to murder them all. And these are some more photos. I am assuming that my mother's father, my grandfather is here amongst these people. Now my father's family did not go out on the street. They did not try to escape and they stayed in their home. So they were not brought here. And sure enough, uh, the objective here was the, the men were told to dig a ditch, undress, and they were shot dead into the pit. And that was the process that took place up at the seventh fort. 
and uh, 5,000 men and a few hundred women who had been raped uh, were also killed. The women were kept inside the fort, <clears throat> inside the barracks. You could see these are new photos. These are photos I took when I visited all of these sites. Uh, the women were in the barracks and um, my mother describes how they saw the men going and they were listening to all of the shooting and um, they knew that uh, my grandfather uh, was most likely killed with the others. Uh, the women were frightened to death because, as I said before, there were a lot of rapes. My mother describes having her younger sisters lie down on top of her so she would not be seen by the militia. These are some photos of the Ninth Fort. These are all killing fields here. And this is an aerial photo of the Seventh Fort. Uh, there are at least 5,000 um, buried here on this hilltop. Uh, this is the neighborhood where, actually where my family, uh, my parents lived. Uh, unfortunately, this fort has been leased or sold to a private entrepreneur who now uh, holds rock concerts and weddings and summer camps uh, on the site. And um, if I wanted to be crass, I could say they're dancing on the dead. The story is very familiar in Eastern Europe. And this story has come to be known as the Holocaust by bullets. Uh, the Nazis organized um, with their local collaborators, more than 2 million Jews in Eastern Europe were murdered right near their homes, right near their towns. Um, they never went to a ghetto. They never went to a concentration camp, uh, never went, they were not killed in a gas chamber. They were killed by bullets right near their homes. The Nazis had mobile killing units that uh, went all around to all the different towns in uh, Eastern Europe and murdered uh, over 2 million Jews in this manner. Um, as a member of the Phoenix Holocaust Association, we brought this exhibit to Phoenix uh, just this year before the pandemic in January, February, March, and we had thousands of students come through the exhibit. And you can't not be changed after seeing that. And this whole pro project, oh, and, and the, the project was run by um, Father Patrick Dubois, who's a French Jesuit priest, and his team, Yahad in Munam, and they traveled all through Eastern Europe and uh, interviewed over 2,000 eyewitnesses. All of these people in the photo you see are Lithuanian eyewitnesses. They were kids at the time of when it happened, but they showed them exactly where the bodies were buried. And so they have logged all of that and documented it uh, for the world to see. Well, the women and the children were released from the seventh fort and they had to walk back home. It, a long story, but they eventually, my grandmother and the four girls eventually came back to the house, which had been ransacked. And um, they had to figure out how they're going to live without Papa, because they were sure he was murdered. Um, so they were trying to get themselves organized when um, one day my grandfather walked into the house and he was alive and he had two SS men, Gestapo men, uh, accompanying him to the house. And as it turned out, he told them the story of what happened to him. And it was the medal that saved his life that day because when the Lithuanian pointed the gun at him to shoot him, my grandfather said, I want you to know you're about to kill a Savonaris, a volunteer. And the Savonaris were very, very well respected in Lithuania. So they pulled him out of the lineup to be shot and they sent him to the Gestapo jail instead. 
and that saved his life at that moment. So needless to say, the joy was tremendous. But right afterwards, uh, the city uh, was declared, uh, anti-Jewish laws were announced. Uh, all Jews lost their citizenship immediately. Uh, there were endless, endless laws. Jews were not allowed to uh, continue in their positions, whether they were doctors or lawyers or teachers or butchers. Non-Jews could not shop in um, a Jewish establishment. And all Jews had to wear the yellow star, which I'm sure you've, you've seen. And then they were all forced to relocate to an area across the river, a very poor area, uh, which, uh, in which a ghetto was created. And so 30,000 people from the city had to relocate to an area that was that had about 7,000 people living there. So it was a little crowded. And what I have here for you is a series of photos that were taken clandestinely because it was forbidden for Jews to have a camera, was forbidden to have a radio. Uh, the, 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 the laws were endless, but I will tell you where these photos came from because it's important to know who took the photo, why they took it, what was the purpose. And um, so I'll tell you more about these photos. So here you have photos of the relocation from the city to the ghetto across the river. And uh, you can see the stars, you can see people with any kind of cart they could bring, uh, some personal belongings, boxes, um, life in the ghetto. The ghetto is basically an open air prison with houses inside. Um, and as you'll see, they were very old wooden rickety houses. It was completely enclosed in barbed wire with guard uh, posts, armed guard posts, and it was locked. And uh, there was no food, uh, hunger, deprivation, no water, no running water, no toilets. They had latrines. You had to go to a pump to get water. Uh, people were dying. Death was all around. There was no real medical attention. Uh, there were constant roll calls and selections and actias, as they called them, actions, roundups. And they would call for an actia, and the end result was always that large groups of people were taken to be killed. So this was going on all the time. Uh, this was one of the ghettos that was one of the long-standing ghettos in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they were in the ghetto from 1941 to 1944. And uh, throughout this whole time, you were living in fear of dying, getting a disease, being worked to death, or killed. And so that was life in the ghetto. Uh, here's some more photos of the ghetto. And uh, again, movement, every time people were killed, people moved into, uh, the, there was reshuffling of the houses. And uh, you see no sidewalks, very, very poor. What you see here is people auctioning off Jewish property after people were killed or after their homes were ransacked. Um, the property was confiscated and it was sold off. So there was a lot of profiteering from the fact that Jews were being killed. Um, and the Holocaust is the largest genocide in history, but it is also the largest robbery in history. Um, not everybody had a place to live. And so some families, some people were living in a shack, in a barn, in, on the street. And here you have an artist's rendition. And during this period of time, there was an active um, project to document what was being done to them. So artists were asked to draw pictures of what they saw. People kept diaries and the photos that you're seeing 
were also part of this project to document to the world what what took place um, and what was done to the Jews. Some more photos. They established a little school, a clandestine school, because it was forbidden, uh, until they found out about the school and they had to uh, stop it. But they had schools. They had a soup kitchen to help people who were starving. There wasn't much food, but at least it was something. There was a bridge between the large ghetto and the small ghetto um, because the road underneath was for the Lithuanians. And um, uh, one day when we talk about an action, this is a little uh, clinic for communicable diseases. They tried to uh, help each other because disease was rampant there. Um, one day the, uh, the Nazis came in, closed up this clinic with the patients, with the doctors and the nurses and burned it to the ground. And this is the artist's rendition of that day. Uh, this is another Axia where people were being relocated. In this particular one, they were relocated to Estonia, usually for slave labor. This is a picture of every morning, the, um, the, the, there was a huge, huge group that was needed to work at that airport that was bombed because the Nazis wanted to renovate that airport. So they took thousands of uh, laborers from the ghetto. My mother labored at the, the um, airport and uh, in the beginning. And she, they had to march uh the equivalent of about uh, 10 miles to the airport and 10 miles back and then a whole uh, stint at the airport she was carrying rocks uh for uh, it, for them to pave the runways and here you see other work brigades they're being taken out of the ghetto to work somewhere and then they're brought back and they are checked when they come back to see that they're not smuggling a potato. And you could be shot if you were smuggling food for your family. Later on, workshops were set up uh, where uh, people would make manufacture goods for the Nazis and for the local population. None of this was paid. I hope you realize this was all uh, slave labor. And this a leather workshop, and then uh, in October of 1941, there was a huge aktia, a roundup. The entire ghetto was called to attention. They had to come to this place here and line up in their families. And it was the story of the right, left, right, left. Um, and uh, people were selected if they looked like they could continue working, they were selected for this side. If they were very young or very old, they were selected for the other line, the death line. And indeed on that day, um, my parents and their families, their direct families were on the work line. They had a special pass because they had special work they were working in the Gestapo workshops, but my great grandmother and many other um, cousins, aunts and uncles were sent on the death line. And if you look at these drawings, you will see going up the hill, lines of people. Over 9,000 were taken up the hill. And this is the the, the road that led up to a place called the Ninth Fort. There's another fort. Every single one of them were killed within the next few days. 9,000 people were killed at the Ninth Fort. And the Ninth Fort was notorious because Jews were sent to the Ninth Fort to be shot from as far afield as France from other parts of Europe, not just Lithuania. So the Ninth Fort was notorious. Today, there's a big memorial there. Um, it's also very controversial. 
And this is an aerial view of the fort. And you can imagine this entire area is filled with bodies. We know exactly what went on at the Ninth Fort because one of my parents' very good friends was a prisoner up there. And his job, he was, he was taken as a prisoner and there were 64 prisoners who were working as Zonderkommando. What's a Zonderkommando? A Zonderkommando, toward the end of the war, the Nazis started to try and hide the evidence. And they had the Zonderkommando dig out the bodies from the last three years and burn them so there would be no evidence. And that was his job until he managed to escape, luckily. And so he gave testimony uh, to what happened up at the Ninth Fort. So you can imagine there were many, many orphans. And so there was a little orphanage that was set up in the ghetto. But many kids were just living on the street. They had no families. Their parents died of disease or, uh, or were taken in a roundup. And so there were kids on the street. And you can see this, this guy is, is holding his little, looks like a little girl. And uh, they look like little street urchins, but they have no home and they're pretty much fending for themselves. And these photos were taken by this man, George Kaddish changed his name eventually. And he was a photographer and he never gave up his camera. He kept it and he hid it inside his shirt with the aperture through a buttonhole. And he took hundreds and hundreds of photos of what was going on in the ghetto. And um, when, when they realized that the war was coming to an end, he, uh, he hid all of his negatives in um, like milk, uh, metal milk uh, cartons and boxes, metal boxes, and he buried it. And he figured that uh, if he survived, he would come back and get the, the photos. Luckily, he survived, and after the war, he came right back and dug up. Most of his photos were okay. Some of them had some damage. And his photos are uh, now in many museums all over the world, and uh, this catalog was created uh, with uh, many of his photos to tell the history of the ghetto in Kovno. So that's why we have so many photos of the Kovno ghetto. So here you can see they're actually posing for him. This is the same boy with his little sister and they're posing for him, um, not knowing what was coming. And here are two others. This, these, these, this photo has become iconic uh, for the Holocaust. Until March 1944, they came in to come and take away all the children, the old people and the infirm. And that was called the Kinderaktia, the children's roundup. And if you read the description of what happened, it is beyond awful to read uh, what was done. They threw the children literally into a truck, took them away and killed over 1,500 that day. It was right after this time in the ghetto, they realized that the Russians are starting a counteroffensive and that it's only a matter of time that they'll get there, but you had to survive. But in the meantime, things happen, and my mother and father met each other in the ghetto during these years, and they fell in love, and they decided to have a wedding. They get married, and that's forbidden was forbidden to get pregnant, forbidden to have a baby. It's all penalty of death. But they figured that at least this way, they don't know if they're going to survive. And they wanted a little bit of happiness before the end. So they actually had an official marriage in hiding. And a few weeks afterwards, um, the Nazis were looking for mechanics because they were preparing their retreat. And my father volunteered to go out. He would be taken out of the ghetto, 
to the garage where the trucks and jeeps were being uh, held, and they had he had they had to prepare them for their retreat. So he came to my mother and he said goodbye. Um, neither of them knew if they would survive, but uh, she gave him the green light to try to escape. And so this was the place today. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, tourist site. But this is where the Nazis kept all the um, all of their vehicles. And this is where my father was taken with a bunch of other mechanics. And they planned an escape. And, uh, and as soon as the moment was right, they scaled the walls. They jumped out. And... Um, many were were found and killed i i won't uh, no spoiler yet meanwhile back in the ghetto they figured they have they 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 don't want to be moved they realized if they're moved they're only going to be taken and killed and so they decided uh for a while already they were building hideouts underground hideouts now you saw that most of these buildings are made of wood okay so you pretty much can guess what happened but this is a photo of somebody putting um, provisions down into a well, which led to his hideout. Unfortunately, they didn't realize, but the Germans bombed and burned because they knew that the Jews were, had built hideouts. And so they burned down the ghetto. And this is what the ghetto looked like after it was destroyed. And, you know, most of these wooden buildings didn't survive. Now, my mother was hiding out, and the smoke got so bad that they said, well, we're going to die this way or that way, so they climbed out of their hideout. But unfortunately, her other sister was in a hideout where they all died in the fire. Uh, this is the entrance to the ghetto. Today, there's a uh, memorial plaque there. And uh, those who were um, found were taken out of the ghetto and uh, they were taken to the trains. And the trains meant only one thing. It was not a good trip. And so these cattle cars, most of the time, had about 200 people in there. There was no food, obviously, no water, no toilet. And there was one little window, and so there was practically no air. People died in the train on the way to wherever they were going. So where were they going? Well, the men, I'm going backwards now, the men were taken all the way down to Germany, in southern Germany, to Dachau. And I'm sure you've heard of the Dachau concentration camp. And this is the entrance to Dachau. And when I visited there last year, I was pleased to see all the students that are being taken on tours there. So the German students are very, very familiar with their history, as awful as it is. And, um, and they were the ones who invited me last year to come and speak to them. So, um, so they, they are getting... Um, a very important Holocaust education. Now, my two grandfathers were taken to Dachau, and these are their prisoner numbers. But actually, they were taken to a subcamp of Dachau, which was further south, near the town of Landsberg, and it was uh, the town of Kaufering. Now, why is Kaufering important, or that area around Kaufering important? That's where Hitler had his Messerschmitt. He was building the Messerschmitt down there. He was building it in other places in Germany, but turns out that the Allies were bombing all of his uh, facilities. And so he got a little upset and he decided he's going to set up new facilities down south in Bavaria and camouflage it. And he built these huge cement. Um, Cast, uh, cast concrete with steel, and he made these big bubbles, which uh, I read were about four, four stories high. And inside, you can see that it's inside here. They're almost underground. 
and they filled it up with sand. And then after they poured the concrete, they pulled out the sand. And that's where they were building the Messerschmitt. And the entire project was done by slave labor. And that's what my, both of my grandfathers were doing. And needless to say, thousands and thousands were were killed, were died uh, from the abuse, the lack of food, uh, disease, and uh, overwork. It was actually, there was a, a, a practice called death by work. And, um, and that's pretty much what happened uh, in this particular facility. These were the huts that they lived in. They had to build them themselves. And this was Kaufering 7, which I visited last year, Kaufering 6. And this is Kaufering 4. And my grandfather, my mother's father, became very ill. And all anybody who was sick was sent to Kaufering 4. You didn't get well in Kaufering 4. And in fact, my grandfather died uh, one month before the Americans uh, liberated Kaufering. Uh, the Americans came at the end of April, and my grandfather died the end of March, according to the documentation I have. And this is what those huts looked like inside, and you can see the sw his swollen legs are from malnutrition, and the disease, the lice, the typhus was, was terrible. Tens of thousands died here. I'm not going to show you what uh, photos are available, and there are many photos. And the Allies, the Americans, took a lot of photos uh, because, uh, as Eisenhower said, um, make sure you take a lot of photos. They took videos. They brought videographers to take videos because Eisenhower said one day somebody's going to say this didn't happen. And he was quite right. Now, backtracking a little, the women were taken to a different concentration camp called Stutthof, and this is where my mother was sent. It's on the Baltic, right on the sea. The women were taken inside. They were given an internal examination on this table. They were given their uniforms, and I'm sure you've seen the striped uniforms and the wooden clogs. Wooden clogs are not the best kind of shoes when you're doing slave labor and marching hundreds and hundreds of miles in the Polish winter. This uh, Stutthof is in Poland. In the concentration camp, my mother met this woman, Henny. She was also from the same city, but they didn't know each other and they met here. And these two women kept each other alive. And that kind of bond, um, is indescribable, and it they they remained the closest of friends until the end of their lives. Now these are the registration forms for my mother, my grandmother, and the two younger sisters. And when I went to the camp, uh, the registrar gave me copies of those registration forms, and they're actually signed by my mother and my grandmother. Unfortunately, um, my the little the little sister was sent. There was a selection, and my little sister was sent to the bad line. And when my grandmother saw that she was going on that line, my grandmother switched to that line to be with her, and they were immediately sent to the trains, which took them to Auschwitz Birkenau and they were immediately murdered. This is Birkenau. They were sent to the gas chambers and the crematorium, and the ashes were strewn here in these little ponds, um, and that was the process. So I decided to go to Lithuania and to Poland to see exactly with my own eyes what happened to my family, where they lived. I mean, every kid wants to see where their parents came from. But I knew my mother was turning in her grave because she would never have allowed me to go to Lithuania or Poland. But I went. I asked for her forgiveness. 
And I went when I saw this book, I found this book written by a Polish historian. And this book had a map in it. And I was always, when I researched my parents' story, my mother always told me she was liberated in the town of Chinov, Chinov. I could never find it on a map. And suddenly, <clears throat> this book had a map of the death marches. And as you can see, here's the camp of Stutov. This is the Baltic Sea. Stutov is right near what used to be called Danzig, but it's Gdansk today, and Gdynia. And they were taken on a death march in January, February, and March in Poland, in the Polish winter, in those clogs you saw. And they marched for two months, and needless to say, thousands died along the way. But mom told me the story, and she said that, you know, they would sleep in barns. Of course, I photographed every barn I saw. I thought maybe mom slept here. She slept, she said they slept in a church one night. And I actually found a church with a mural which shows the um uh the death march of the prisoners from Stutov. So I figured this must have been the church. And then she said they slept one night in a prison, in a jail. And she remembers that because it was warm in there. But the the downside was that when the body warmed up, the lice got very, very active. And they all had, they all suffered from body lice. And body lice, the lice brings typhus. And so uh, my mother and many of her friends were sick with typhus. But from the jail, they eventually came to the town of Chinov. They stayed in a barn. And um, mom was very sick. She was almost dead. And then one morning they woke up and the Germans were gone. That was it. And a few hours later, the Russians came in. And so uh, that, was, that was the end of the war. But that wasn't the end of the, the challenges. And so um, mom eventually uh, recuperated. Uh, from the typhus. She survived the typhus. She and her friends went out into the village to look for food. And uh, the Russians set up a little clinic to help them and they gave them food. And uh, so they recuperated and then everybody says, okay, so now what? Now what, what do you do? So the first thing you need food, you need to get healthy again. And then right after that, you got to know what happened to everybody else. And of course, that's the moment when you either got the good news or the bad news, or in most cases, they had no news. They had no idea what happened to their families. And to this day, uh, many of the survivors never had a clue of what happened to their families. And this is, it's a horrible thing. And so um, the story is, is, is very much uh, described by mom in the book. And um, <clears throat> this is the first photo that was taken of my mother. Here she is with the thing on her head. They all had their heads shaved by the Russians. And this is her friend Henny that I showed you. And they had this other little group of women. Two of them were nurses. And so they made sure that they didn't eat the wrong things because unfortunately the history is full of cases where uh, as soon as they were liberated, they went and they looked for food and they guzzled food and they died immediately because their bodies could not take it after so many years of starvation. But the nurses kept them alive and told them you can't eat and you know it was very, very slow uh, trying to get their health back. And so, but you take a look here and all of a sudden you see a guy standing there. So who's that guy? That's my grandfather, the grandfather who survived Kaufering. And uh, this is quite a few months after the liberation. And the story of how he found my mother 
if you saw it in a movie, you would say, oh, that's Hollywood bull. But it's true. The way he found her is beyond belief. And he was the one who went around from village to village looking for family. And so he found my mother and uh, he reunited my mother with her sister, my father's sister, and my father's mother, my grandmother. My father's family survived intact after ghetto, concentration camps, and death march. My mother's family did not. My mother's family were all killed, except for one sister who survived. Uh, so just to give you a picture of my mother's journey during those 10 years between 1940 and 1950 when we came to the United States, and I say we and I'll tell you how, um, <clears throat> these are her toing and froing throughout Europe, uh, which uh, was not easy because after the war, the Russians closed the borders and my mother managed to sneak into Kaunas because she heard my father was still alive and he was on the other side. And so that story of how she snuck in and how they snuck out is another movie. Uh, and it was always, always dangerous. Uh, they eventually made their way to a town called Landsberg, which is outside of Munich in southern Germany. Uh, after the war, there were many displaced persons camps uh, in Germany, Austria, and Italy. And um, my parents were reunited with my father's parents and with the two, uh, with my mother's sister and the other, uh, my father's sister in the DP camp. And this is when they could finally, they had help and uh, they were given food and they were given accommodations and um, medical attention because most of the survivors were, were ill with something. And they tried to get their life back together. And of course, the first thing they had to find work and my mother always wanted to be a doctor. So she got a job as a, as a clerk in this medical clinic in the DP camp. Here's my mother up here. And my father, of course, he got a job with the carpool, uh, taking care of the Jeeps and the cars and the trucks in the camp. And so he always had wheels and they always went on trips and uh, trying to regain their lost youth. And uh, they met up with friends and they were very much in love. And uh, when you're in love, things happen. And that's where I was born. So I was born in the Landsberg DP camp. And um, the next thing that most of the survivors were doing, they were in the process of trying to find a new home. And so uh, my parents, from both sides of the family, we had relatives all over the world, in the United States, in Uruguay, in Rhodesia, in South Africa, in um, Argentina, and, uh, and of course, Palestine, eventually Israel, was also uh, on, the, on the list of possible places. But uh, when they heard that in Israel there was a war going on and there was very little food, uh, my mother was afraid to go there with a the child. So um, they focused their attention on trying to get a visa to the United States. It took a few years because there were quotas. And eventually we got on a ship, the USS General Ballou, and we came to the United States. Here we are on the ship. And um, all new immigrants see the, the Green Lady, the Statue of Liberty and everybody it's it's you there are no words as a refugee or as an immigrant coming in with the history that they had of um when you see this it is 
it, it is an emotional experience. But uh, my mother was very worried. They had no language. They didn't speak English. They didn't have any money. They barely had a real trade. And, uh, you know, she was worried about what would happen to them. But that's the challenges for refugees and immigrants. And um, they worked hard, made their way forward made a good life for all of us. And uh, mom, pop died early from cancer. He was only 68, 68 years old. Mom died at 90 years old. And she always said that every year after the war was a gift for her. And indeed she got to see, um, this is the, we are part of her legacy. The, she has three daughters and eight grandchildren. Uh, Bobe in Yiddish <clears throat> means grandmother. So these are her eight grandchildren. So Bobe's grandkids, and she's the Shana Bobe, the beautiful Bobe they called her. And five uh, great grandchildren. Unfortunately, she didn't really get to see this. She's the oldest, but uh, mom, mom was not in good shape when she, after she was born. But she didn't see the others. But that's her legacy. And mom and Henny remained best of friends until they could no longer communicate with each other. And this is my granddaughter, my youngest granddaughter, Zoe, who is named after my mother, Zlata. In Jewish tradition, uh, children are often named after a deceased relative. And uh, so Zoe is for Zlata. And so uh, my message is, uh, after my talks, when I'm speaking to students, um, it is so important for kids to interview their parents, but their grandparents or their great grandparents. Because when they eventually do want to ask questions, it might be too late. Now you in the audience, my guess is that many of you are grandparents and you might even be great grandparents. Make sure you tell your children, your descendants, your history, whatever your history is from wherever. I've done this exercise with kids from a hundred different countries. And it is, it is so beautiful to hear their stories. And sometimes those stories are very difficult stories. Grandparents who went through difficult times, regardless what country. And so it's important for the kids to know where they came from. So please make sure you tell your story to your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. Um, Mama always used to say to me, what doesn't kill you will make you strong. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's pretty clever. I, I only recently found out that Nietzsche said it before her. But uh, that's helped me in, in my life, and I've raised my kids that way as well. And uh, it is so important to be aware and be active in safeguarding our democracy. And this is an important message. Um, all of the uh, laws that were enacted during the, the war, the Second World War, they were all legal. Those were laws. And so um, you got to safeguard the democracy, speak up, speak out against intolerance, injustice, and hate. So that's my story and I'll stick to it. And uh, if uh, anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer if I can. Well, Eddie, uh, thank you for sharing the story. I know there's there's more details uh, in, and uh, uh, stories that, within the book, but uh, this uh, hour has been fascinating, uh, to sh at least in, in my case, and I, I think in, in uh, uh, that of our, our audience, that's uh, sharing a, a different view of what we may have learned in, in the history books in school. And as always, that is part of the mission of the CAF, is to go beyond what we normally uh, here and to share the stories of the men and women. Most times we do it with airplanes, but in this case we're doing it with. Uh, I gave you a few airplanes. Are, hey, I gave there you were. 
<laughs> That's right, the Messy Schmitz, and we appreciate that. And uh, uh, you had mentioned um, something early on about trauma uh, being uh, transgenerational, but but also uh, one of the questions from our, our audience is how how do you think uh, your mother and the other survivors dealt with with the uh, the trauma that they had gone through? Let's face it, in the '40s there was no such thing as post traumatic stress syndrome, at least as we know it today. I mean, it, it still happened, but how do you think they were able to cope and go on and lead productive and, and, and successful lives. How did they do it? Um, <clears throat> some of them did it well, better than others, and some didn't do it well at all. Um, I would say that on the productive side, making a life, making a living, taking care of their family, uh, all of them did well. On the emotional side, we all are witnesses to our parents' traumas. Um, it, we might not know the stories because not everybody who's traumatized tells the story. Uh, I know, I've read about so many GIs who never told their families what they saw. They never mentioned it. And... Um, so the survivors also, many of them never talked about it. And the kids, because the kids became protective of their parents, they were afraid to ask because you didn't want to upset your parents because you knew that they suffered. And you never, ever wanted to cause your parents any more suffering. That was, that's almost a common denominator amongst all second generation. So how did they do it? Uh, there was still a lot of suffering. And there, like you said, there was no clinical PS PTSD. There was no such thing, but they were all suffering from it. So almost every single survivor had nightmares and screaming and outbursts and certain behaviors that we as, as their children always identified. You know, to us, it was normal. But uh, now, in retrospect, we know that that was that was their um, that was how it manifested itself. The trauma. Now, you know, they they were all left with nothing, no family. You know, most survivors, uh, their children had no aunts, no uncles, no cousins, no grandparents, nobody, and. Um, and that's very, very difficult, particularly on holidays. So, uh, so there were many different kinds of manifestations. I could go on for hours, but uh, I'm sure there are some other questions. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, you did. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, before we, we went on, on the educational initiative in the state of Arizona uh, regarding the Holocaust. Yeah, thanks for, for that. Yes, um, the Phoenix Holocaust Association and the Arizona legislature um, uh, took on an initiative. It started last year, and we have recently passed legislation. I shouldn't say we, we were involved in it, but the legislature passed a mandate uh, for Holocaust education in Arizona schools. Um, a, the Holocaust is now to enter the curriculum in middle school and in high school, once in middle school, once in high. And we are now the, um, I think we're the 14th state in the United States to mandate Holocaust education. Um, and so we're, we're very proud of that. It's Holocaust and other genocides. And uh, so we're very proud that um, that we were we were able to participate in moving that initiative forward, and um, and that the the kids in in uh, Arizona will learn about the Holocaust in school. Great, um, actually. 
not a whole lot of questions that have come in, but we do have some comments thanking you for sharing the story. And uh, I believe uh, some of our, our viewers have been touched very emotionally by, by the story as well. And uh, your book, uh, along with some of the other books that uh, you referenced in your presentation, we'll be sending out uh, the, the titles and, and links to those in a follow-up email after this uh, session is over. But we do have uh, three of our uh, attendees who are going to receive a copy of your book, uh, and that is Jay Taylor, Malcolm Gully and Beth Bashke. And uh, Leah will be uh, contacting you and uh, get uh, through the email and uh, so she can get your address and, and uh, get copies of the books. And again, we'll, we'll follow up with uh, additional information uh, tomorrow morning uh, following, the, uh, following this presentation. Uh, Dr. Zilber, thank you for uh, sharing your time and story with us uh, tonight. Any, any final thoughts before we sign off? Um, well, uh, how many do you do you know a count of how many people are in the audience? I'm just curious. Uh, I believe it's I just uh, got a, a total view. Uh, we started off um, kind of small, so people must have shared. We had 22 in the beginning, and I just counted we had 53 people um, show up tonight. So, and that's just the beginning. Um, I'd like to remind everyone we we tape these presentations so that we can share them. Teachers actually get um, credit, continuing education credit in the state of Texas for watching these webinars. So if you have teachers or you know people who you would like to share this presentation with, um, you'll get a copy of it via email as well. Wonderful. Well, I just want to thank the CAF for their. Uh, their interest, their initiative in maintaining and educating uh, youth and adults um, to our history, our common history, and uh, unique history. And, uh, and thanks to everybody for listening. All right, Dr. Zilber, thank you again. And again, thanks to uh, our audience uh, watching tonight. I'm Steve Buss. Thank you, and uh, have a good evening.